It's quite an honor to be here. Um, thank you on behalf of all of us providers. You guys are why you, the reason we are able to do what we do on a daily basis. And I know you've been hit it so much, and it's such a crunch everywhere. I work in California, and and we, I really, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for everything you do every day. I really appreciate that. So hopefully this is intended to clarify. Uh, bypass is something that may not be done as much anymore, indeed, but it's still some role for it, and we'll go for uh, about uh, this. I have no disclosures about this. There you go. All right, so PAD, I think uh, you had a talk already on PAD, but it's stenosis or occlusions of the arteries uh, from the infrarenal aorta down, peripheral arterial disease, and about 98% of the time will be due to atherosclerotic disease, plaque formation, some other non-atherosclerotic reasons, but we will concentrate on atherosclerotic uh, formations. And you can see that above the disease, we call that inflow, the disease itself or the target, we call the lesion, and then below the disease, hopefully we'll have some sort of landing strip, and we call that outflow. And these are going to be things that we're going to use in terms of describe bypass things. Now, PAD, clinically speaking, may be there and give no symptoms to the patients for a variety of reasons, and we call that asymptomatic PAD. That doesn't mean these patients are healthy. That means that they don't have limb-related symptoms. But these patients are at risk for cardiovascular events, and you all know that. So that's why when they're in the discharge, after whatever procedure, make sure they get the antithrombotic therapy, make sure they get the statin therapy, be part of the prescription in the discharge planning and, and, and uh, education that you guys do. Now, intermediate claudication is something that I think we're doing a little bit less and less, hopefully. Uh, and it's pain when you walk in the calf or in the thighs, depends on the, in, on the lesion location and the limb distribution of the discomfort. But it's reproducible, vasculogenic, you stop, it goes away, it's benign, it doesn't progress. At, uh, and in generally, sometimes you need to treat it with, you know, intervention, but in general medical management, we will be able to manage most of these patients. Now, critical limb ischemia is kind of the target where most of the endovascular and open revascularizations are happening. And they're very different animals as I, I see all these three uh, presentations, okay? Now, the treatment options, as I said, there's medical therapy, there is endovascular therapy, and what I'm gonna be talking about a little bit is the bypass uh, world. Um, so, in terms of indications, which is the first premise of the presentation, for asymptomatic patients, we don't do any, and we shouldn't. For intermediate claudicator patients, I think the typical approved indication would be disabling claudication after failed medical therapy. So we try medical therapy, didn't work out, and then only then we do that. And if we choose between endovascular and bypass, we'll do endovascular first. And if that fails, maybe a couple of times, maybe only then bypass. Now, in critical limb ischemia, it's a little bit more complex disease and more burden of disease, more distribution everywhere in the big arteries, in the small arteries, in the medial layer of the arteries. So a little bit more complicated decision making. So I think bypass still plays a role on that. Bypass goes long, long time. Nobel Prize was awarded to this chap who actually discovered surgical conducts, Alexis Carell and his patch. And the designation, the way we write our post-op plans and, and, and orders and, and procedure dictations, and you read and interpret when you're uh, taking care of these patients, it comes from somewhere, in this case, for example, ephemeral. It goes somewhere, in this case, a popliteal, and the conduit that we use, for example, in this case, was a graft. So this is a femoral popliteal graft. Another example will be, we came from the femoral, we went to the posterior tibial, and we use a vein. So we use a vein femoral to posterior tibial bypass. That's kind of the acronym. And there's a bunch of conduits, and veins are part of the autogenous conduits. Arterial uh, uh, conduits also exist, but we don't use them that much. And then there's prosthetics, there's biological, there's by engineer. So lots and lots of conducts. And we're going to start talking a little bit about them. Autogenous conducts, the gold standard is the great esophagus vein. We, you've seen it use. And then we can use arm veins as well, and then some other arterial conduits, but they rarely use. So why veins? Because they're metabolically active. Every time we do a bypass with a vein, it's like doing a transplantation, to be honest. You're transplanting an organ somewhere else, and it really is metabolically active, and it works really, really well to maintain patency, and they change over time, they arterialize, they uh, matrix accumulation, they get thicker, and that's kind of the rationale why they last so long. And also, if you extrapolate the other subset of patients that would put things together, the AV 
fistula patients, that's kind of the same concept. And that's why those fistulas are able to be poked with needles because they dilate and they, they get thicker and they keep patients alive. So the vein configurations are many, uh, in situ, reverse configuration, non-reverse configuration, and there's a bunch of technical issues. This is really an operation that takes time and we're doing less and less. When I trained 22 years ago, we did a lot of them and then endovascular properly so, challenge, open, and it's less invasive. It doesn't last as much, but it's really less invasive. And, um, you know, it's essentially been replacing a lot, of, a lot of things. But, you know, you have a lot of techniques, and the whole idea is to minimize injury to the vein that we're using. And, uh, you know, if you are in the OR, you know that you prep the whole leg, and sometimes you prep both legs because you're going to harvest the other side. So pretty demanding uh, surgery, and you have you go through a bunch of little steps here in order to get finally to the actual bypass itself. And the arm veins are second, they're not as good. And again, sometimes in some patients you'll have to prep arms as well as the lower extremity in terms of to put things together, so pretty much. Now, uh, other procedures uh, like remote endorectomy are kind of a hybrid between the two. We, we cut down on the groin, then we remove the plaque with some sort of um, devices, and then, you know, it's kind of an atherectomy, but open in a sense, and uh, you get a large core. And that's another open hybrid technique that we use to remove plaque. Prostate grafts were kind of the panacea uh, in terms of, okay, they're off the shelf, we put them in, we suture only two times, we tunnel them and we're done, faster certainly. Uh, but, you know, and there's a different uh, types of uh, prosthetic grafts out there. And the bottom line is uh, they're commercialized and the bottom line is when they compete, uh, they're really not as good compared to the greatest aphenous vein. Cryopreserve also came along, these are patients uh, that the patients that have received this been followed properly, and again, their performance is not as good as um, greater saphenous vein autologists. And some other allografts um, that are being, you know, modified biologically, like human umbilical vein, also did not pan out to be that good. So judging performance of this, all these players, if you may, you see that compare randomized controlled trials when we compare vein versus a uh, graphs. See, above the knee, the gap is there. Below the knee, the gap is certainly there. And then below the knee, uh, compare different types in all different configurations. At the end of the day, the greatest saphenous vein uh, is the best uh, out there. So at the end of the day, this is really the slide that you want to go. If you have family members or somebody's asking to you, I'm about to have a bypass, my surgeon's talking, talking about a bypass, what is your conduit status? And if you have autogenous greater saphenous vein, that's the way you should go. If they're not, then arm vein is a secondary thing. And of course, that patient has to be renally sufficient. Otherwise, you cannot touch them. And if not, then you have your third alternatives, remote enorectomy and allografts or prosthetic grafts itself. So the last premise was, when do I do a bypass in 2022? And like the previous speaker, everything keeps updating and in, Minimal invasive approaches continue to prevail. So in intravenous claudication, pretty much I haven't done one in 22 years, to be honest. And uh, in critical limb ischemia, I think in you have an end of failure and still persistent wound, I think is certainly uh, a role for bypass surgery. And when to do the novo, that is another ongoing question that has not been answered yet, but I think it is like everything else. The patient risk, the presence of autologous, uh, autogenous uh, graft, and the amount of disease that needs to be treated endovascularly, and you put that together in your skill set, and then you put it. So in our experience, we have very much lot of disease and available conduit in an average risk patient. That's when we will do a bypass. Thank you very much for your attention.